Hello, you're listening to the Super Power You podcast. This is episode 76. I'm Lisa betz lacroix and my guest today is sexologist, author, and priestess, Francesca Gentili. There's a richness in our erotic life that I believe is untapped toward our wholeness. That if we looked at our fantasies in a symbolic way, if we if we really started to lean into some of this as a road to consciousness, you know, what becomes possible? Welcome to the Super Power You Podcast, where we reveal the mental models and tactical skills needed to activate your inner superhero. And here's your host, Lisa betz lacroix Hello, hello. Welcome to the Super Power You Podcast. Thank you so much for coming back or for listening to the show for the first time. Perhaps it was sent to you by a friend or by a family member who thought you might find it interesting. And if you enjoy the show, I'd ask you to please send a review over to us on the Super Power You Facebook page, or you can do it on any podcast platform. Uh, telling us what you think helps us to make the show better and also helps us reach more people. Okay, so today we are doing part two of my conversation with Francesca Gentili. Last week's show focused on healing childhood trauma and dating and interacting with anyone in your life as a blessing. It was a fantastic conversation. I just loved conversing with Francesca. And so our conversation ended up going on for quite a long time. And because I like to keep the episodes reasonably short, this is part two. Today, we are going to be talking about some edgier aspects of sexuality. So parents, if you have kids riding along with you in the car, <laughs> you might want to just be forewarned that you might want to pre-listen to this conversation and make sure it's appropriate uh, for your kids. To my mind, there's nothing highly explicit about it, but the topic area is something you want to just make sure that is okay for you to have your kids listening to. Okay, when you're listening to this conversation, I will be in Sedona for the Women Speak Festival that you've been hearing me talk about if you're a regular listener for a long time. And in fact, the show, the conversation, the festival will be live streamed. And you can go to the Facebook page at Superpower You, and I'll have the live streaming link. And if you're interested in following along, I'm actually going to be the opening speaker at 6 p.m. on Friday night, Mountain Time. So would love you to be watching the live stream and would love to hear your feedback. And I thank you in advance for all the support I've gotten for working on this project and for putting this talk together and for being a stand for rebranding aging and for telling new stories about what empowered aging looks like. Like. In fact, in our conversation today with Francesca, we get into the wisdom that Francesca brings about what it means to age well and to age in an empowered way. And I loved the conversation because she brings such beautiful, nuanced perspectives. And every voice is needed as we go about changing a cultural narrative as deep as those that exist around aging. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Francesca Gentili. Let's jump right on in now. And at the end of the conversation, I will add a part you've already heard if you listened last week, and that is the general wrap up and conversation about superpowers. So that's going to wrap up both part one and part two. Thank you for being here. Let's jump on in. Francesca Gentile is a certified clinical sexologist, quantum shaman, the co-author of The Marriage of Sex and Spirit, the radio host of Sex, Tantra, and Kama Sutra, and the host of the popular Facebook live series, The Conscious Bachelorette. She teaches on recovery from trauma, bridging sexual differences, relationship by design, enchanted dating, sacred sexuality, and therapeutic BDSM nationally and internationally. I want to offer a very warm welcome to you, Francesca Gentili. Welcome to the Superpower You podcast. I am super delighted to be here. One of the things I find really fascinating, and I'm wondering if you could address a bit, is that you are such um, a stand, it seems like, my interpretation, obviously my story, for authenticity, for connection with self, for love, compassion. Um, and you also work in edgier worlds of the sex and relational um relational worlds like uh, BDSM. And I'm wondering if you can just talk about how that fits in either in your life, in your journey, or in your work 
helping people to find the kind of authentic connections um, with themselves and with others that that so many people are seeking? Um, the authenticity piece for me is to the extent that I'm not willing to face myself or shame myself, I cannot really show up in our relationship and I can't really receive your love. Mm -hmm. So if I'm shaming, denigrating, hiding either from me or from you, then you could say, Francesca, I just adore you. You're just like, you're the best. And I'd be like, she's lying. She's lying because you don't know me. So I'd be thinking to myself, oh my God, if she really knew me, she couldn't love me. So it's so... Oh my God, did you think I was lying when I said I adore you? No, I didn't. (laughs) I I didn't because I've done the work. You know, I've done, I've done the work to, you know, to actually show up revealed in the world. So when you say you love me, it's like, yeah, you've seen me, you know, break down on Facebook. You've seen me talk about my, you know, my traumas. You've seen me, you know, even though we haven't met yet, you've seen me in my highs and my lows. Welcome to me. You're seeing me. So if you're saying I love you or I adore you, then I know that you're seeing something that's pretty close to who I am. And so because you've taken the risk of showing up fully and presenting yourself and you've taken that risk. Yeah. So you actually are the one that creates the possibility for someone to appreciate you and honor you and see you by showing up real. Exactly. And then I think, you know, BDSM or some of the edgier parts of love or sex or relationship are there because in my journey as a priestess, and so I've been a, an initiated priestess for over 30 years and now have like five different shamanic or priestessy kind of initiations along with my more clinical stuff, is, you know, what I saw was I just have such a hunger to understand human nature. How does the mind work? How does the body work? Where do we get our erotic templates, right? If we keep having a fantasy about having sex from the chandelier, you know, and it's, and we just like every night we have this, where does that come from? And, and as I started to uh, research this and to be called into exploring it, because my divine essence, my God essence in me, and you have God essence in you has guided me to be a field researcher of life, to not just read about it, but to go in and be there watching or participating really right up there close and personal. So as I started to do this, I got a um, literally a download about a class that I was supposed to teach called Dark Eros, the Temple of Power and Surrender. And when I got that download, I started to see visions of uh, torch lit processions in ancient temples where people would be flogged or tied or whatever, and not as punishment, but actually as vision quest to help them go into trance or vision quest or help them cleanse their body or atone and or make an offering to the divine. And I was seeing this like from past lives. And I heard like a voice say that I was meant to teach this, but that I couldn't teach it until I knew what was happening in the modern world of BDSM. And the intriguing thing for me is I did not identify as kinky. I didn't have kinky fantasies. I didn't watch The Secretary or Fifty Shades of Grey or, you know, read The Reclaiming of Sleeping Beauty or or, uh, read Jacqueline Carey's Cushiel's Dart and identify with the kinky parts of it. So I, I, if you had asked me if I was kinky, I would have actually said no. But I met a man who was, um, we started dating and he sat me down and after a few dates and he said, Francesca, you know, I'm a very sensual and tantric guy and we can definitely have our relationship there. But I've, I was born and raised in San Francisco. And, and since I was 17, I've been sneaking into the BDSM clubs and I am a kinky dominant and it's a huge part of me. And you don't have to be kinky with me, but you need to honor that this is a big part of my identity. And when he said that, I heard a voice in my head say, he is your doorway. He is your portal to understand what modern kink is. And I uh, I said, I think I'm supposed to know this. And he and I shared a spiritual path and a spiritual training. And a few weeks later, we were at a temple and we were staying there the weekend. And I got a download in the morning and I woke him up and I knelt next to the bed and I said, I have a gift for you. And he said, can it wait? (laughs) And he said, no. And he said, okay. And I was naked kneeling next to the bed. And I said, I offer myself to you in unconditional love, service, and devotion, heart, body, mind, spirit, and eros. 
And he said, wow, does this mean you want my collar? And at the time, I didn't know what a collar was. So I meditated. I said, let me check. And I meditated. And I felt I got a yes. So I said yes. And that was the beginning of what would have me be a collared slave for four years. So I just went from zero to 60 or 120, just like way into the deep end of the pool overnight. And it was, uh, I have to tell you, it was pretty shocking at first. But I was able to find the sacred because I had already been a priestess for 25 years. And so I said, I am not leaving the sacred behind to enter into the world of BDSM. The divine has led me here. So I am going to be sacred within these dungeons, within these parties. And when I would meet people and they'd say, what are you into? And people often mean like, are you dominant or or submissive? You know, do you like flogging or being tied up? You know, I would say I'm into sacred kink. And one of two things would happen. People would either lean in and they'd say, almost like it was a dirty little whisper, you know, I feel energy move through me when I'm in a scene, or I feel something, or I've always felt that BDSM was sacred, or their eyes would get very wide and they'd, you know, thank me for sharing and walk away. (laughs) You know, so one of two things would happen. And what I really saw and just felt so blessed by is that the divine is everywhere and everything. Like if we look at the definition of God, in all religions throughout time, we would say that God is omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, all places at all times, omniscient, all-knowing, eternal and infinite before the beginning, after the end. So based on the definition of God, is there anywhere where God is not? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. So by definition of every religion you can think of, God is in everything at all times. Then how do we have rape and murder? And how do we have the abuse of children? Like, how does this even happen? And what I came to is we have free will. And it's not the thing that is sacred or unsacred, it is who we're being in relationship to that thing. So like food, you know, right relationship with food is that food can be absolutely sacred. I can say a prayer over it. I can savor it. I can savor the the life that's in this bite. You know, I could just go so deep into the meditation of eating and, and, you know, feel like I'm seeing God in a bite of an apple, or I could just go into a binge where I'm just scarfing down my food to try to avoid deeper pain. And that food, I'm no longer in a sacred relationship with that food. But the food, the food is inherently has the potential to be sacred, but I have free will. And that's true for, I believe, everything in sexuality. If flogging, a good flogging with a heavy flogger is like a great massage, (laughs) you know? And if you spank someone like right at the butt cheek, like right between, you know, where the thigh and the butt meet, there's receptors there. There are neurosynaptic receptors that for some people, if you spank them just right there, they can have an orgasm. Wow. I'm not one of those people, but wow. I mean, how cool is that? You know, so it's not the thing, you know, for some people being tied up is like a baby being swaddled. It helps them feel their body. It helps them feel held and like they belong. And we look at things and we judge them. But a kiss, like a little kiss, if I wanted to kiss you, but you didn't want to be kissed and I'm like, kiss me, kiss me, Lisa, kiss me, kiss me. And like, I grab you and I kiss you. That like little kiss becomes an abusive thing. It's not the thing that makes it sacred or unsacred. It's the level of consciousness. It's the communion. It's the consent. It's the intentionality. It's the presence that really has anything be sacred or unsacred. And being entering into the world of BDSM, I got that on a whole new level. And then also coming from not identifying as kinky to finding my my own bridge to kink helped me, you know, once again, be such a great coach and counselor for couples when one person identifies as something that their partner doesn't, or their partner is initially judgmental or uh, activated by or triggered by. And so now like, I feel so blessed by this, but yeah, it's, it's so important, I believe. And for those listening who want to be in a healthy relationship, never shame the desire in you or anyone else. It doesn't mean you have to do it. 
Some fantasies are better kept in fantasies. As someone who's now explored some of these, I can tell you that some of them are much better as a fantasy. Because in a fantasy, everything's happening perfectly for me, right? right. And I have, a, I have a fantasy of being ravished by a pirate. But in my fantasy, he doesn't smell bad. You know, in my fantasy, <laughs> I'm not getting, you know, uh, splinters on my butt from the the deck. You know, in my fantasy, even though he's ripped off my clothes, they're going to be folded really nicely because I love my clothes. They're going to be folded really nicely <laughs> to the side. You know, so in my fantasy, everything's perfect. But if that happened in real life, and I've had boyfriends who've had boats and they've wanted to give me this fantasy, I'm like, don't do it. Do not give me this fantasy. It will. <laughs> you want to keep the fantasy. Like, it will not live up to my fantasy. Trust me. So it's important to understand that if my partner shares a fantasy, a desire to say thank you, I can always say thank you for honoring me with sharing that, even if I I'm not sure I'm going to align with that. I'm not sure I'm the right person to do that with. Or let's see if we can keep it in the realm of fantasy. Like I could do an erotic hypnosis for you, so you feel like it's happening even though we're not engaging in it. How's that? Always thank the person for giving the desire, never shame it, and never shame a desire inside yourself. And fantasies are like dreams. A repetitive fantasy that won't go away is like a repetitive dream. It's the soul speaking in symbolic language. So if I dream about a chair over and over, it doesn't mean that I'm supposed to go to Ikea and buy a chair. If I'm dreaming about a chair, it might mean that it's time for me to rest. It might mean that it's time for me to claim my throne and my power. It might mean that it's time for me to build a foundation. You know, the chair could mean so many different things. It would take a little bit of time and maybe a guide on the side to unpack what a chair means to me. Well, the same is true for a fantasy. If I have a repetitive fantasy about being ravished by a pirate, you know, it might mean that I need more adventure in my life. It might mean that I need to claim the wildness in me. It might mean any number of things. It doesn't necessarily mean that I need to go find a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's it's really, there's like a richness in our fantasy life. There's a richness in our erotic life that I believe is untapped toward our wholeness. That if we looked at our fantasies in a symbolic way, if we if we really started to lean into some of this as a road to consciousness, you know, what becomes possible? Yeah, I'm just letting that sink in a little bit because I, no, it's such a such a such a totally beautiful description and so rich and in terms of your own personal journey and your own understanding and you know bringing the conversation full circle back to where we where we began in a way you know you mentioning food and how anything I think the idea that anything can be sacred it's really how we hold it and the consciousness the level of consciousness intention consent that we bring to it that's really landing with me and really hitting me and I, I believe that to be so true is that the sacred can be illuminated and deepened in anything that we do what a great, great description of that um, there's so many places I still want to go. Okay, so <laughs> you let me know if you run out of time. Otherwise, I'm going to keep okay. going. A month or so ago, I made a commitment for the next year. And my commitment is to taking a stand and making a difference in the way our culture perceives aging. And I think we also talked about that somewhere um, in some form or another. But I, I have such a strong and, and, and deep feeling of the need for our culture and our mindset and the way we approach our own aging and age in others to get a redo, to get a rewrite, to be reinvented because science and medicine are creating new realities where so many more people are going to live so many more years. And in fact, some people even believe that the first person to see 150 has already been born. And the impact of that is that we now have not years added on to our end, but years added on to our midlife. So much more opportunity for a vibrant midlife. And when I mentioned that, you sent me a video that you had done, which I'll, I'll link to in the show notes around your perception of your, your idea of being of sexy one. Is it sexy one? <laughs> sexy fun. Is that right? Sexy fun. Sexy fun. That's right. There we go. <laughs> sexy fun. Um, and yeah, and I'm just wondering if you can share just because I'm really all about amplifying and rebranding this experience. So many people get to be 
X age. For some people, it's even really young. Mm-hmm. I hear young mm-hmm. people who are 30 talking about, I'm afraid of how quickly, you know, I'm getting old, I'm getting old. I'm like, whoa. So just in the spirit of my own commitment to amplifying the message that we can see aging differently and we can take it on, we can rebrand it, we can reinvent it, and we can live it in completely different ways. And you are such a beautiful and compelling example of that. Maybe talk about your thoughts on aging and what it means to you and how you approach it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I love that. Let's, let's do something more together around aging. I think we're both so juicy and we like, this is, we're passionate about this. So I'm just like, you know, putting a little flag there for us. So aging, hmm, I say that we want to make friends with aging, or we're going to spend the rest of our lives in bed with an enemy. And Let's just breathe that one in for a second. Because it's coming. <laughs> you know, yeah, because we're going to spend our whole lives aging. We're going to spend our whole lives aging and then we're going to die. So if I make aging an enemy, what would it look like if we made aging a friend? What, what would it look like if we made aging a gift? And then we're stepping out of, we're being very revolutionary and radical when we do this, is to say, what what would it look like? And for me, I started to look at uh, aging empowered, aging gracefully, aging juicy, um, probably in my 40s. But I do hear some clients that start to question that they're too old by the time they're in their 30s. I've heard that. But for me, I started to look at aging powerfully. And so one of the things I invite our listeners to do is to start collecting people in your life that are older than you, that are models for who you want to be. They can be uh, anywhere in the world. They can be from any field. You know, they could be from media. And I also encourage us to collect them from the past. So one of my favorite models of, uh, of empowered aging was the mother of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill from the 1940s, a World War II time. He was the, the prime minister of England. And he was known to have said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Winston Churchill, very, very well known at the time. His mother was actually an American, Jenny Churchill, and her father was one of the railroad barons. And she came over to England in the 1800s to look for a husband. She married Lord Randolph Churchill, who died of syphilis when she was still fairly young. She had already had Winston, but uh, he uh, contracted syphilis and died. And she, in, in the 1800s, she had her own magazine. She had a tattoo of a snake around her wrist. She uh, was uh, purported to be a lover of King Edward, who had many fascinating women around him. And she married for either the second or third time, a man in his 40s, when she was in her 60s. Uh, and Jenny's just one example that I've collected. And what I say to myself is, hey, if Jenny could do this in the 1800s, with the lack of information that we have about hormones and empowered aging, etc., that was available at that time, I can certainly do it now. And then I started to create what did I want to be as a legacy? What was if I didn't quite see the elders around me that I wanted to become, then then what would I want ahead of me? And let me just become that. So I wanted wisdom. You know, aging is not a guarantee of wisdom. Youth is not a guarantee of ignorance. But aging is an opportunity. So a possible gift of aging is wisdom. A possible gift of aging is grace and graciousness. A possible gift of aging is compassion for life and the life experience. A possible gift of aging is style. A possible gift of aging is an inner beauty that shines from the inside out. A possible gift of aging is the capacity to own our sexuality and own ourselves in a way that is irresistible and irreplaceable. There's a saying, this, the, the riper the berry, the sweeter the juice. We can actually you know, get juicier and more beautiful and more delicious as we age if that's the vision that we're holding for ourselves and working toward it. And one layer of working toward it is what am I doing daily to work in? Just like to have a physical body that works, I want to work out. To have a calm mind and a generous heart, I need to work in daily. So I need to work in, and this is for the rest of my life. I need to define what are my core values. How can I live in this world in a way that I'm proud of? Not because someone else has created those core values for me 
but because I am living in integrity with mine. What is my personal style? What are the colors that delight me? What are the time periods around the world that I most resonate with? Let me create my own personal style around that, that is timeless, that is ageless. How can I engage in self-loving behavior, literal actionable behavior, whether that's looking in the mirror, whether that's taking a, a luscious half an hour to caress myself from head to toe and say, I love you. I love you, body. Thank you for being the vessel of my spirit on earth. Uh, to get a massage or my nails done. What can I do that's an actionable behavior to turn off the phone and the computer or listen to something inspiring that is my action of self-love that lets me know that I'm in a primary loving relationship with myself? And what I find is that as I've engaged in that since I was 40 and now I'm sexy fun, that as I've engaged in these practices and behaviors, I keep hearing more and more people tell me that I'm beautiful. I keep hearing more and more people inspired by who I am, including me, (laughs) that I actually am becoming that elder. I am that elder that I would have wanted around me. And in terms of dating, I actually coach a lot of 30-year-olds in their dating. And one of my 30-year-olds was saying, you don't know what it's like to date men in their 30s. And like you're dating a completely different type of man. And I sat myself down and I did the math. And I realized that the year I turned 50, my first partner uh, who'd pursued me was 14 years younger. And we were together two years. The partner after him was 19 years younger, younger. We were together four years. The partner after him was a year younger. We were together a year. The partner after him was 23 years younger. And he had pursued me for three years. And none of those relationships ended because of age difference. They ended for the usual reasons that people end, you know, that you're growing in different directions. You reach a point where you no longer can come into alignment. You recognize that maybe there's some traumas that you're activating in each other that you're not going to be able to heal. You know, the usual reasons. And last year I dated four men, approximately two months each, not overlapping. And all of these men except one were in their 30s. And it's kind of still the case now. I'm dating now. And many of them are in their 30s. And I'm I'm actually delighted by this because it gives me real-time data on what it is to date men in their 30s. So if a woman says men in their 30s are not gracious or kind, I can say I have evidence to the opposite. Men in, in their 30s aren't willing to be gentlemanly. I have evidence to the opposite. Men in their 30s aren't able or willing to be honest. I have evidence that they're hungry to be honest. They just need a safe space to speak their truth into. Mm -hmm. And I would say this is true for all men. And I recommend the anti-aging medicine conferences and getting the research. The research is out there right now. Get information for the symptoms of aging so that we can ameliorate them. We can reduce them, shift them in such a way that we're not suffering in the aging process, whether that's hot flashes, migraines, weight gain, whatever. It doesn't have to happen. What I see in you that I recognize in myself is a commitment to and an honoring of not just the usual aspects of becoming older, although those are important and beautiful too, the possibilities of choosing to grow in such a way where we become more wise, where we have more to contribute, but also recognizing ways to enjoy and elaborate on and deepen the juiciness and the beauty and the both physical and inner beauty and to not leave those behind. Because I know sometimes when I talk about the fact that I want to change the way we see aging, I'll hear from people say, yeah, I really love that, love that idea. That's so important. I love the idea of the old, the old wise woman. And, you know, while the old wise woman is a beautiful archetype and something to appreciate and to develop, I think there are so many more layers, so many more flavors of what's possible for us as we go into, into future years. And I, and I love the idea of the time timelessness. And I think of it as uh, being a perennial, you know, continuing to recreate and re-evolve and reinvent um, year after year based on whatever is the current time for that season. So I really appreciate uh, all those deepening elements that you also bring to the conversation and just elaborated on. 
Absolutely. And so for me personally, I wasn't looking. I mean, some, hey, if, if you're listening to this and the idea of being the elder sage woman, you know, who's celebrating her wrinkles and her gray hair and her extra pounds. And I, I did have a mentor who she lost her libido. She, you know, went gray. She, uh, she's like, now I'm a crone. And she really celebrated. Like there, there was a point where she grieved it, but then she really celebrated. She was like, I love being a crone. And she, she rocked the, the little wrinkled apple lady kind of thing. She really rocked that. And that delighted her. And if that delights you, go for that. And that doesn't delight me. What I have gathered is looking at like the Jenny Churchills and looking at the I would call her a femme eternal, looking at the woman who is aging in a way that is, you know, beautiful. And you can tell that she's, she's older. She doesn't look like she's 20. She doesn't look like she's 30. The Christy Brinkley. Oh, and my, uh, my favorite Helen Mirren, you know, Helen Mirren, she's now like 78 and she still rocks a bikini. She doesn't look like she's 20, 30, 40, or even 50. She looks like she's an older woman, but she still looks sensual and mm-hmm. juicy. Is she going to be everyone's cup of tea? Perhaps not. She's mine. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm totally I'm, with you. I'm not yeah. sure I would throw her out of bed for eating crackers. And, you know, <laughs> and I think that there are other men that would feel that way about her. Susan Sarandon. You know, yeah. that if you are listening and you want to be like the juicy, vital, erotic woman as she ages, that is also possible. And I think whatever you're choosing, it's create a vision of her. How does she dress? What is her haircut? Does she wear makeup or not? Does she color her hair or not? Is mm-hmm. her hair long or short? How does she dress? Oh, what was that? That Freaky Friday with uh, Jamie Lee Curtis when she and her daughter like crash into each other and they switch bodies. So the the teenager is now in to technically in the mother's body. And what happens is in the film is the mother goes from being this very dumpy, frumpy mother uh, who, who's wearing like soccer mom clothes to she's now a teenager with the mother's credit card in the mother's body. (laughs) So she goes and she buys all this like really like hip clothing, but appropriate, you know, like hip, but appropriate clothing. And it's like, you see Jamie Lee Curtis transform in front of your eyes. Uh, The film Shirley Valentine is about that too, based in England, you know, where she transforms. So, you know, we want to, we want to have this vision and we want to live into that vision. Yeah, it's funny that you bring up the piece of the clothes and the story of the woman who just accepted her croneness because the talk that I'll be giving in May in Sedona at the Women Speak Festival is called The Crone Needs New Clothes, Rebranding Aging. <laughs> and, you know, because I, I, I just, I think we need to reclaim that word because I, I don't like the crone. For me, like you say, it might be right for some people, but the idea of the wizened, wrinkled woman wearing a black cape with the big craggy nose is that's not my idea of my croneness, you know, my, I, like my secondary line is like, hey, the crone needs new clothes. Hell, I'm a Latin dancer. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> and how old are you, honey? I am 54. Mm, such, such a delicious 54 too. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good place to be. And it's really exciting to look at how all these stories are changing and being, uh, and, and playing a part in, in changing them. Like it's, yeah, it's yummy and fun. And like, let's redo this stuff, you know? But listen, it is the Superpower You podcast. And so we cannot end our conversation without talking about your superpower. And for context, <laughs> The way I describe a superpower to my guests is it's that skill set or that strength that has been with you your entire life, no matter the age or the stage, and regardless of what type of work you've been doing or what type of, um, you know, what type of model you're playing in, but it's been with you all the time. And it's so natural to you that it's like the air you breathe or the water you swim in. But to other people, it looks like you're scaling a vertical hill. And so for many people, they don't necessarily know their superpower unless it's been reflected back to them by others. Sometimes we get at it. Sometimes I have a sense of it. But I always like to start by asking my guests if you have a sense with that context of your superpower. I would say, and feel free to tell me what you think mine yeah, is too, sure. but I, I would say that, uh, you know, I, I think I might have more than one, is one of them is bridging 
bridging differences. Bingo. Uh, That's what I was going to say too. (laughs) (laughs) And explaining, you know, like, and that could be explaining the wild to the conservative, explaining the conservative to the wild. I have actually worked in interracial relations when I was, you know, clearly I need to catch up on that. But, um, (laughs) but uh, I, I, you know, for many years I was, uh, you know, working in cultural diversity and would be, you know, helping to bridge those different perspectives and different lives uh, bridging, you know, the, uh, the masculine to the feminine. Mm -hmm. So I, I've, I've been doing that for my mom and dad since I was a child, you know, dad, uh, when you say this, do you actually mean this? Ah, mom, dad, dad actually means this. Mm -hmm. Um, when, and when mom says this, she actually means this other thing. Isn't that correct, mom? Uh Uh-huh. So I being able to hear people beneath their words, and yep. even explain them to themselves. Well, and of course, the obvious, right, of bridging the physical and the spirit world, br- bridging, mm-hmm. you know, sacredness with, um, you know, sexuality, which are not necessarily polar opposites, but I think that they're often put on separate sides of the same thing. So, yeah, I absolutely see you as someone who is a bridger. And there's something for me about the ability to be articulate and to verbally express that which is in some ways ineffable. And I see that as a bridge too. It's like like you're bridging the abstract with the 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 language that goes with it that that elaborates on it. You know, that's another bridge to me. Yeah, I absolutely see you as as someone who's able to marry seeming opposites or se- seeming opposing forces and to bring them higher through the marrying of them. That the bridging actually raises the stakes and raises the importance of and raises the power. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for saying that and. And for being someone who sees and honors that divine spark and that divine superpower, we might say that divine calling uh, in other people. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm going to breathe that one in. (laughs) (sighs) Okay. So I want to thank you so much for your time. But before we wrap up, could you please share with my listeners how they can follow you, where they can find you, how they can explore the possibility of working with you, what type of offerings you have coming up, just anything. Because I know that after hearing this conversation, people are going to be wanting to know how they can get some of this magic. Uh Thank you, sweetheart. Oh, I want to say to our listeners that you can have a free hour consult. Just say that you heard it here and put gift session in an email to me. That is to relationshipdiva at gmail.com. That's relationshipdiva at gmail.com. And I'm Francesca, F-R-A-N-C-E-S-C-A, Gentile, G-E-N, G's in good, E-N-T-I-L-L-E. And you can Google me for uh, my Facebook. If you're friending me, please send a note as well. And also, my website, francescagentile.com. And I've got resources there and videos there and book recommendations there and articles there. And it's, it's really my mission is to create a world of inner peace and harmonious relationships in which sexuality is experienced as a blessing. And I, I just love to do whatever I can to support individuals, couples and moresomes. <laughs> to to live like that so once again free gift for our listeners and i can i'm a one woman business so i can get super busy if you email me and don't hear back from me it's not against you in any way just ping me again because when i'm with clients or on an interview or something else i'm not at my computer and sometimes i can miss the emails that come in but you're in my heart and i'm here to support you And I will include all of those links that Francesca mentioned in the show notes. So I just want to say thank you so much. This conversation has been a blessing to me, and I know it has been to so many of my listeners as well. So I want to thank you deeply and gratefully for the work that you're doing in the world and for the healing that you're bringing to so many people into the planet. And thank you for spending the time here with me today. It's been my pleasure. Big mwah! to you, Lisa. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Do you see what I mean? Do you see why I loved my conversation with Francesca? Do you see why I'm so thrilled to have met her? Ah, So much good stuff there. So much wisdom. 
If you would like information about anything we mentioned in the show, as always, you can go to the show notes at lisabl.com slash 76. Other than that, I think I'm going to leave that for today. I hope you're having a fantastic day and I send you big love. Till next week. Thank you for listening to the Super Power You podcast. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes and get more information at lisabl.com.